So without any ado, let's, let's kind of get started. Um, a quick introduction for myself. My name is Ben. I'm a paramedic with Southeast Coast Ambulance Service. Been wearing green for 13, 14 years, something about that. And I normally have a bit more of a, an interest in ECGs and head injuries and trauma. I also have a bit of an interest in our long lie patients for reasons that hopefully you'll get as we go through. Um, so let's quickly look at some learning outcomes, first of all. Let's look at some terminology. What is the terminology? Obviously, I haven't put it there because we'll get to it in a minute. What does it do? Who's at risk? Pre-hospital signs and symptoms, considerations, pre-hospital treatment, in-hospital treatment, and leave at home advice. I've already seen through some of the chat there was lots of uh, doctors, ODPs, and people working in hospitals. But I think it's also important for us pre-hospitally to make sure we manage these patients correctly to try and avoid them from coming into hospital. So I also think that's really important. So when we talk about terminology, we're all quite happy with the term long lie. Someone who's been on the floor for a long time. But there's also other terminologies that you may hear. Toxic, toxic lie, AKI, rhabdomyolysis, acute kidney injury or acute kidney failure. And the reason I wanted to put this up is because these terms can be so quickly interchangeable depending on what setting you are, you're in. I've worked pre-hospitally pretty much my entire career and all I kept hearing was toxic line, long line. It's only recently in the last few years that I actually understand what it means. But the two medical terms that we actually need to look at is rhabdomyolysis and acute kidney injury. These are the ones which are the official terminologies that we shall be using for the rest of the presentation. So first of all, let's look at rhabdomyolysis. What is rhabdomyolysis? Well, it's, it's very simply a buildup of toxins within the body, but can be life-threatening further down the line. Now, what does that mean? Is that you may start have these toxins, but actually it needs to accumulate to a certain point for then you to display signs and symptoms and then become unwell. But where do these toxins come from? Well, very simply, it's a breakdown of predominantly muscles that's released into the bloodstream that can't be excreted easily. Who's at risk? Well, very simply, you know, these are the groups of patients who've been in the same position for a very long time or have had excess pressure on tissues or muscles at a single site. I've written single site there, but it can be multiple sites throughout the body. So who, who's at risk? There's quite a few different groups of patients who are at risk of rhabdomyolysis. And I think it's very important for us just to quickly skip over some of them. Oh, what group is this pre-hospitally? So simple example, I've got exercise up here, first of all. On the left, you see a spin class. On the right, you see my gym partner, Axel. The reason why I've put these up is that on spin classes, there's been cases of patients who have attended a 45 minute spin class and developed rhabdomyolysis. They were fit, young and healthy. Similar, there's been instances of bodybuilders or crossfitters who have experienced rhabdomyolysis after going to the gym. Now, if we go back to the example, well, these aren't the ones in the same position for a long time. These are the groups who experience excess pressure on tissues, muscles at a single site. Our next group, crush injuries. Once again, this isn't a huge group that we particularly see. And a lot of the evidence, if you start reading about it, comes from major disasters, you know, buildings collapsing, earthquakes and so forth. And a lot of the data has been picked up from there. But once again, going back to the groups, going back to the two potential groups, are these the ones in the same position for a long time or the ones with the excess pressure? Well, they're both, aren't they? They can be both. And once again, it's predominantly going to be multiple sites. Sleeping, not necessarily sleeping, but there has been lots of single cases where people have gone to bed and woken up with rhabdomyolysis. And just to put this into context, um, there's a single case study that I recently read about where a lady who's uh, having difficulty sleeping, she's also in chronic pain. So she's already on quite a lot of opioids and the doctors have decided to prescribe her with a sleeping tablet, quite a strong sleeping tablet. And she's gone to bed and she's fallen asleep and she hasn't moved for about 14 hours. Now the actual part of her body touching the mattress is fine, but she slept on her arm. Now going back to those two potentials, is it the long position in the single position or is it the pressure? Once again, it's a combination of both. 
but who is the larger pre-hospital group? And that's what we're going to really be looking at. And it's this group, the elderly fallers. Well, I say elderly, it doesn't necessarily have to be the elderly fallers. It could be the elderly or low mobility fallers. These are the ones who take up a large chunk of ambulance time, 20 to 30% of 999 calls. And we leave approximately 50% of these at home. And that's a large number. If you consider an average trust takes about four, five, six, sometimes 10,000 calls in a day, this equates to hundreds of patients a day who we're potentially leaving at home who may have acute kidney injury. But we're going to get to a little bit more to that a little bit later. We're talking about falls. I just want to clarify, we're not here to talk about strokes, incontinence, or any of those bits. We're here purely to talk about the falls. These patients have been on the floor for a period of time, okay? So let's go back to who's at risk at this. Patients who've been in the same position for a long time. Excess pressure, tissue, muscle, a single site. Those are the ones who most likely get it, but how does it work? What's the pathophysiology of it? So we know if you apply a large amount of pressure or long pressure on a tissue muscle, predominantly muscle, it will break down, the cells will degenerate, and that will enter the bloodstream and it will release creating kinase, myoglobin, and lots of other elements as well. But I've listed them too for a particular reason, which we're going to get onto on the next slide. So we have those two elements. We have the myoglobin and the creatine kinase. It's now floating through the body, and the body needs to excrete it. And it gets to the kidneys, and it just blocks them up. It blocks up the loops, loops of Henle. And if you were to look at the anatomy and physiology of the loops of Henle, the whole idea is to almost get down to that singular cell so it can go down and, and regulate what's, what's in the body. But now we've got these larger elements who are almost congesting the loops of Henle as it's going round. And the more and more it congests leads to acute kidney failure or acute kidney injury, whatever terminology you want to use. And that's the bit that is dangerous for our patients. But once again, that's subject to a number of different factors, isn't it? You know, we can't expect everyone to be exactly the same. So what, what factors are there? What factors are, are going to change this? Well, quite a few. Fluid intake, body size and kidney function. And let's put this into context by means of fluid intake. If I base this on myself, I'm a 95 kilo male. I'm relatively fit. My average fluid intake is about two and a half litres, three litres of fluid a day. If I'm going to the gym, that could easily be three and a half litres, even four litres, depending on what I'm doing. I'm not obese. I'm in relatively good shape. And my kidney function, I'd say, is, is pretty good. So by means of that, that's going to be a good production. But is it the same for our elderly and low mobility? I think with the low mobility, we also need to be quite clear that that could arrange from people who have necessary disease and so forth and have low mobility at a young age, but are still relatively fit and healthy. But when we look at our elderly and we look at those three points, fluid intake, I'm, my dad's in his 70s trying to encourage him to drink more water. He just doesn't do it or he struggles to do it. Body size of our elderly, you know, we see these very cachectic, frail people who you know, even when we visit them and they're deemed to be in health, are probably dehydrated already. And then we look at a kidney function. We look at these simple kidney functions. And as we get older, well, we know, we understand when we're younger, we don't use our kidneys to full capacity, but over time they degenerate. And actually, as we get older and older, our kidneys don't function as well. So the simple fact that we're older, we already have reduced kidney function. And that's not a good thing. So why is this important? Well, it's important for lots of reasons. The kidneys are there to regulate the body. They're to make sure we've got all the good stuff is in and the bad stuff's taken out or keeping that balance. It's all about regulation. So potassium, calcium, sodium, CO2 and fluid levels. There's other elements in there. But for me, as a paramedic, those are the ones that are really interesting to me. Because if you go to a patient pre-hospitally and they say to you, ah, oh, I've 
had a blood test with the doctor and they said, I've got high, low potassium. What does that make you think? High, low potassium or calcium or sodium. Well, I know what organs already spring into my mind over them. Similar. Excess fluid or excess potassium, low potassium, whatever, I can then start looking at what could go wrong with the body. So if we can't regulate the elements, then what? Hyperkalemia. You know, we start talking about potassium, so sodiums, calciums, cardiac arrhythmias, or worst case, cardiac arrest. That's not good, is it? Acidosis, the CO2 builds up. We don't want our patients to be acidotic. We don't want them to go and move into organ failure. Because once again, that's life-threatening and that will cause death. Similar thing, volume overload, pulmonary edema, heart failure. You know, we may see swelling in arms, legs, in those types of places as well. All of those are life-threatening conditions. But what we've gone to is a very simple fall. So acute kidney injury, acute kidney failure, whatever terminology you choose to use, can mean death. So it's estimated about 100,000 deaths in the UK are due to acute kidney injury. And it's, once again, it's estimated they reckon about 30% of these could be avoided. One in five emergency admittance has an acute kidney injury and 65% of these start in the community. I've taken these figures from, for, for anyone who does a lot of presentations, especially on something like this, the more you read, you could quickly end up going down a wormhole and it just opens up so much. So I've put the reference of this one at the bottom. All references are available at the end as well. And the reason being is when you start looking at one in five emergency admittance, um, a lot of them are sepsis. They're not necessarily these foolers who are going to all these dangerous long lives. So the question is, is a non-injury fall a non-injury fall? Now, I know, you know, from my fellow uh, pre-hospital staff, you know, we very quickly categorise falls as non-injury, but are they? Should we be taking all calls, all fallers to hospital? Probably not. Probably not. We just need to make sure that we're assessing these patients and assessing them really, really well. Okay. So, signs, symptoms, considerations. I've listed a few signs and symptoms up here. Unfortunately, it's a little bit more complex than that. And for reasons that we're going to look at in a few more slides, but let's quickly look over some of them. And also I've alluded to it here. Some may have no symptoms at the time of assessment. Pressure sores can be a bit of a red herring because pressure sores could be the fact they're just building up a very slow pressure sore in that particular area. If they're not known to have a pressure sore in that area and we think they're developing one, we definitely need to consider referring that person. Do they need to go to hospital if they're stage one? Probably not. Stage two and above, potentially. The one thing I like about this particular slide is where we've got this bottom picture. Let me just turn on my pointer. Where we've got this bottom picture here. We've got this contact to the floor, but sometimes we forget about the contact of, you know, it could be your malleolus against your, your calf, or it could be your knee against your thigh. It could be, you know, your arm against another arm because of your sleeping position. It could be other positions. And sometimes we just need to check. We need to do this thorough check to make sure we're not seeing any pressure sores. Now, I've kind of said at the beginning, this is a bit of a red herring, but also I think this is starting to be important. In the, in the pre-hospital ambulance world, patients are waiting longer for us and it's very easy to have this confirmational bias we see it on the screen it's come through non-injury fall mrs miggins perfect you go along you pick her up you fill out some paperwork you off, off you go at the time she seems well you don't worry about it but 12 hours down the line pressure sores could easily start developing and we need to have a better look and a good look at these patients as I said there, they may not be present at time assessment, but we need to try and have a look. And we need to document it as well. We need to document. 
confusion. Why confusion? This was, this was a little bit of a wormhole for me when I was writing this particular one. Because if we were to get an elderly person, not let them drink for 10, 12 hours or however long they've been on the floor, they could just be a little bit confused from that. They could be a little bit confused because they haven't had their medication, depending on what medication they're on. They could be confused because their blood sugars are low because they haven't eaten anything in the last few hours, which is out of their routine. Or it could be confused that they're having a buildup of urea because their kidneys are blocked. And it's just that little bit of confusion starting off and it's going to slowly progress. So if the patient's on their own, try and establish whether that confusion is new or ongoing. It's very easy to get tied up with dementia and all those other conditions as well. And sometimes just a little bit of age, people can get a bit confused. I know sometimes I can get a bit confused. You're in production. This is, this is for me really important for our, for our patients. Have they passed any urine? We have Mrs. Miggins, she's fallen at midnight. We've got there at 10 o'clock in the morning. 10 hours, most 10 hours, you would expect people to go for a wee at least. Have they passed anyone? Have they been incontinent? That's an important question to ask, an important thing to look for. Because if they haven't been for a wee, haven't produced any urine, well, maybe they were dehydrated when they fell and now they've got an extra 10 hours on top of it. Is it painful while passing urine? Now, why is it painful? Well, the loops of Henley are getting blocked up we're kind of not really processing much urine. The kidneys are starting to get a little bit inflamed and it can just be a bit painful. And that leads to the next one, painful kidney area. So we need to really look at some colors as well. Like we've got no color, excess fluid intake. So very clear or that kind of slightly straw is how I would describe it. They described it yellow here. I would always describe it as that slight straw. Dark yellow, like it says, in, insufficient fluid. Most adults should be able to compensate for that. Do our elderly compensate well for that? Well, probably not. They probably don't compensate very well for that at all. Amber, dark yellow. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of people probably get that a bit mixed up. But these are the important ones. Oh, what color is it? Yeah. Orange, foamy, red. If we're starting to go to elderly, long lies, who are commenting on they've got orange, foamy, or red page or red urine, we need to be looking to transport them to hospital. If it's orange, yeah, maybe encourage a bit of fluid, maybe refer to GP, depending on what GP services are like. It could just be the fact they're just a little bit dehydrated. But when we get down to this brown, so the way I describe it when I when I do my other teaching, it's almost like that this kind of light Coca-Cola colour. It's almost frothy Coca-Cola color. If that's the color of their urine, they definitely, definitely need to go to hospital because they're showing signs of kidney failure. Um, also there's green on there as well. There's also, you can have blue as well. A lot of the time, if you're having blue or that kind of discoloring uh, urination, um, it's probably because you've had some kind of dive, you know, whether you're having a CT, MRI scan or something like that. Also, we do need to be quite careful if someone consumes large amounts of beetroot, um, their urine can quite easily be that reddy color as well. We also need to be consideration of whether there is blood in urine, especially for females, if they're still able to menstruate, it could easily get confused. This is actually the color of their urine. This is not spotting, this is not nothing else. Okay, so. Do we ask our questions correctly for these patients? What was the time of their last wee? I know that sometimes that one easily skips my mind. And also they may not have needed a wee. So let's put that into a little bit of context. They've woken up, they've had their breakfast, they've had their little cup of tea, they've then fallen, they've waited four or five hours for us. And then when you speak to them, no, I normally just wee in the morning and then I wee mid afternoon. They may not have needed a wee, but actually the time of their wee was fine the first time. But second time, we're not quite there yet. We're just not quite there. Oh, I thought there was a bit more to that one. Yep. We always have to consider their kidneys may not be blocked yet because it takes a bit of time. And once again, depending on what literature you read, depending on what literature you read or where you've got your literature from, it can really vary. It can really, really vary. And also I said, they may not have drunk anything recently. So considerations. So now we're looking at our patients as a whole. Frailty. They could be small, 
they may not have much tissue for cushioning. Now, what does that actually mean? It means the pressure is directly on their muscles, uh, allowing for more potentially more breakdown. Then we have the other end of the scale. We may have these large patients who may they will have the extra adipose tissue to kind of defend them, but then also we may have the excess weight pushing down onto the muscles, creating the rhabdomyolysis. We also have to consider medication. If they're on steroids, how often do we go to these patients who are on like prednisolone is quite a common one, and they've just covered in lots of small bruises across their body. These patients are slightly higher risk. Patients on blood thinners or antiplatelets, diuretics, definitely diuretics, because they may well be kept in this constant slight dehydration state for whatever reason, whether that be blood pressure or heart failure. Diabetic medications. They may not necessarily feel the pain in their kidneys areas. And also, I, I must admit, diabetic medications, I'm not completely au fait with the full uh, pharmacology side of it, but it is a consideration. Hypertensive, similar thing. Pharmacology is not my strong point with these medications, but these are contributing factors for them. Other considerations. Incontinence, I've already alluded to it a few slides before. Hypothermia, they've been lying on the floor for a, a period of time. Is that the fact they've been lying on something cold? Is it the fact the environment's cold? Or are they just cold and we can't quite figure out why? A new shortness of breath that wasn't there when they first fell. We also have to consider whether these patients are frequent fallers. Do they have anti-fall devices as well? Or are these people who have all of a sudden fallen two or three times in quick succession when they never used to fall before, but all of them are coming through as a non-injury? We need to take all of this into consideration about how much danger or risk they are. So, these are the considerations, time on the floor. So I'm going to open up this to the chat. I'm going to give it a few moments. How long do people think is an acceptable, non-acceptable length of time on the floor? So, so I'll give everyone 30 seconds or so, put it in the chat, and I'll ask the moderator just to open their mic and give me some answers and see what people say. So um, Mark is saying under one hour. Um, okay. Rob is saying under one hour or so. Uh, Martin says two to four hours. Uh, Jennifer, oh my gosh, they're going very quickly. <laughs> uh, Jennifer <laughs> said six hours. I'm having to scroll back up. Um, but recently she's read an hour. Faye says three hours. Uh, Michael, over four hours. So we've got quite a mix, really. Yeah. Paul and says two to four hours. Um and that's perfect. Oh, and that's kind of exactly gone, on, gone. On. If you've got some more, gone. I was going to say 30 minutes. Uh, Ian says 30 minutes. Um, and, so the generally from the 30 minute to six hour bracket. And, and this for us is the real complication of these patients. Because considerations, time on the floor, you know, we've already said there 30 minutes and so forth. Now, if we look back to some of the examples, 45 minute spin class and an exercise class. I used to do spin, hated every minute of it. The classes were never more than 45 minutes. The gym classes, when I get to go to the gym, you know, a couple of hours, some bodybuilders may do it for four hours at a time. So what about if I threw that into the mix, the type of floor, what are they laying on? Does that now change your time of risk? Example being, someone has fallen kitchen or bathroom. I've used these two rooms because normally it's these laminating floors. A lot of the elderly that we go to may not have refurbished in recent years, to safe to say, and it is this hard laminate plastic flooring. Similar, what happens if they fall in the front room? And let's just say they have refurbished in recent years and they've got this nice, plush, thick carpet with a nice little lush underlay. Oh, once again, just quickly, people write down, does that now change your time, knowing what type of surface they're laying on? So once again, I'll give it 30 seconds or so. So Mark says same under one hour. Under one uh, hour. Um, Nicola says it's patient dependent still. Jane yeah. says, no, it doesn't. Caroline says, yes, it does. <laughs> um, Paul Brilliant. says long board had a time limit of 30 minutes. So he's going to go with that. <laughs> So, on, so Mark, when we're talking long board, do you mean like the big yellow rescue boards that carry ambulance? Is that what you mean? Yeah, you mean those, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, okay, yeah. 
Yeah, and you're right. And you know, I've, I've as part of my current studies, I did a, a, an essay on immobilization, and some of the stuff we do is quite dangerous for exactly this kind of reasons. So we've got a type of flaw, and some people are saying it's the same, some people it's different. What if I threw this into the mix? Have they been stationary? Have they been in the same position for the entire time? Does that now change the time for you to consider whether they've had rhabdomyolysis or acute kidney injury? So okay, I'll give it 30 seconds for people just to write down, um, give me some answers, and I say as they pop up, read them out. So some people were slightly ahead of you with that one, saying um, if they can wriggle, it changes. If they're able to shift the weight, it changes. Um, oh, someone's saying about whether it's inside or outside, it changed the time. Yeah. And this is, this is all, everything people are saying is music to my ears. Because this is, this is part of the problem. And I know them, uh, my local trust, they've put guidelines of four hours. If someone's on the floor for four hours, then they should be considered for, for A&E. I'm friends who are doctors. I've got friends who are A&E consultants. And they think they should come in sooner. And I think it's all about assessing the risk of a lot of these patients, isn't it? So, so this is another really, really strong consideration. Levels of hydration. Because going back to what we now understand, we understand that pressure on muscles means it degenerates and means that it will go through the kidneys. But actually, if we're well hydrated, and actually we can filter these elements through slower, the kidneys should, I say should, hopefully cope with that. That shouldn't be a problem. Are our elderly well hydrated? You know, I think I could probably answer that on a mass population of, generally speaking, no. So what do we need to consider? We need to consider their kidney function, the last time they went for a wee, how much they've drunk as well. You know, little Mrs. Miggins may only have three cups of tea a day. And we've got to understand that not all fluid intake is through water, but obviously that's where we're going to get the larger chunks of it. How many ready meals do the elderly eat or meals on wheels that probably don't look very well hydrated? And when did they last drink? I think I've put them wrong. Yeah, those two go out at the end. And these are all really strong considerations that we've got to take into consideration pre hospitally So I'm going back to my examples. The sleeping one is quite obvious. They were lying in the same position, pressure directly relating to the arm. The exercise ones were slightly different. Now, going back to the first question, what group were they? Were they ones with the long lie or were they ones with the excess pressure? These ones with excess pressure. And the exercise groups all had one thing in common. They were all deemed to be dehydrated or mildly dehydrated before they started exercising. And I think that's really important for us to understand. So what do we do hospitally? We're suspecting rhabdomyolysis or acute kidney injury or acute kidney failure. And I've put it at the top there and we're transporting to ED. Fluids, slowly. Now, why slowly? Well, we've got to consider there are other medical conditions. Now, I've, now I've just alluded to heart failure there because that's the most obvious one for me. If I overload a patient with heart failure for no real probable cause, their blood pressure is okay, everything else looking okay, that's gonna be my consideration is heart failure. But there are other medical conditions out there. You could also ask them just to slowly sip some water. And also, I think, you know, in the chat group, it said it a few times, just because we're kind of learning and understanding that rhabdo blocks up kidneys, fluids could help, I've got a hammer, now everything's a nail, or you've been on the floor for a while, I'm going to give you everyone fluid. Look at your patient, think whether they need it or not. And if you're unsure, wait. I could do another whole lesson on sodium chloride and the goodness and bads of it pre-hospitally, but I won't waste everyone's time today. So a few days later, this is, I think, pre-hospitally, an element that we don't understand. I've put a few days later, but I would actually say this could be 12 hours later, 14 hours later. After we've gone over, we've picked them up, we've done our assessment, we've done all our normal bits and bobs, we've left. Another ambulance call has come in. They now just feel unwell. They've got a bit of fatigue, the back pain. Something's not quite right. Or urine output, they haven't urinated 
since we've left. They've drunk plenty, but they just haven't urinated. Well, it could be anything. It could be lots of things. They could be unwell for multiple reasons. We've got to consider acute kidney injury. We've got to. You know, acute kidney failure. We've already alluded to the fact that this kills our patients if we don't deal with it correctly. So what do they do in hospital? So we take our patients to ED. Um, the first things they're going to do is, is bloods. Um, as I say, one of my friends is an ED consultant. After talking to him about this, they say if they think it's rhabdo or they think it's acute kidney injury, they would normally start them on a bag of fluid quite slowly, uh, assuming they've taken into consideration all the other medical comorbidities. But bloods. Bloods is what they're going to do first. And they're going to look for creatine kinase is predominantly one to see whether it's elevated, to see whether the kidneys are struggling to process that. Okay. So then we go on to our leave at home advice. And once again, I think pre hospitally, we don't always do this as thoroughly as like, I'm, I'm as guilty as the next person for doing this. We've gone to our non injury fools, we've picked them up. We want our patients to monitor their urine output. I'm not saying getting there a jug and measuring it, but making sure they're still going at points that they would consider going. Monitoring the urine colour. That is vitally important. They may well have a norm. They may be always be slightly orange, but now it's starting to go darker. It's red or even brown. But we also need to make sure that we've documented for these bits, if there's someone else there, loved one, relative, family member, whoever, to make sure that, if they do look fatigue or they get malaise, they've got limb pain, vomiting, nausea, confusion, or even loss of consciousness. All of these could be down to acute kidney injury from a very simple fall that's happened 20 hours ago. Very simple fall. So I've kind of rattled through this as well. It's quite unusual for me. Normally I waffle for hours. So conclusions of this. We need to consider the length of time and the amount of pressure placed on one area. We need to consider the surface type. We also need to consider their levels of hydration and any unusual symptoms that we just can't quite put our finger on. Because pre hospital I know we see a lot of these patients where they say this and other, but if, we're, if we've got our spidey senses are tingling, then maybe we need to be transporting these patients to hospital for that acute kidney injury. The thing is, they may not have one, and they may come straight back. But if they have got an acute kidney injury, to put it into perspective, patients with acute kidney injury don't just spend a few days. They can spend weeks, sometimes months, trying to resolve that kidney injury, depending on how, how severe it is. And then if they start having acidosis, they start having a fluid, then you know, it just creates more and more into the mix. More medical interventions need to be done, and that becomes more problematic for our patients. 